We're going to read together from the Old Testament, from Lamentations, and from chapter 3. By now, I hope you will have picked up that there is a kind of theme that is running through what we're doing here, and uh, there are no prizes for this, but uh, faithfulness is the, is the line down which we're walking. Page 688, in case that's of help to you. Lamentations isn't always easy to find. It's always in the same place, but it isn't easy always to find. It never actually moves. It's in between Jeremiah and, uh, and Ezekiel. And we won't read the whole chapter. There are some 66 verses. We'll just read part of it. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stones. He has made my paths crooked. He is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. I have become the laughingstock of all peoples the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Amen. Father, help us as we look to the Bible together now. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, it's a few Sunday nights ago since we looked together at the patience of God as an aspect of his character. And before we come around the Lord's table this evening, I want us to think for a moment or two concerning the faithfulness of God. The most common way in which the word faithfulness is heard today, I think you would agree, is with the negative prefix un. We are familiar with unfaithfulness in the realm of marriage, in the matter of ethics, in the issues of theology. And it is because man is man that we are as we are in relationship to these things. And one of the distinguishing marks of divinity in relationship to humanity is in this very distinction. And in the Old Testament, Balaam, in that famous discourse and interchange with Balak, uh, urges him to recognize that there exists no link between the unreliability of man and the absolute trustworthiness of God. There's actually a huge gap between man's unreliability and God's faithfulness. And in Numbers 23, we read these words, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And when we take up our Bibles, we realize that the Scriptures speak uh, consistently and superlatively of the faithfulness of God. 
It's virtually impossible to read one's way through the Psalms without coming on this again and again. For example, your steadfast love extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Psalm 36, O Lord of hosts, who is mighty as you are with your faithfulness all around you? Psalm 89, or in Psalm 119, your faithfulness endures to all generations. So you have this picture of the psalmist surveying everything and looking around and realizing that if he looks up into the heavens, the very expanse of the heavens is insufficient to contain the extent of the faithfulness of God. As he thinks of God, surrounded, surrounded by faithfulness, the commitment that he has made to his people and to his promises and to his covenant. So faithfulness is an aspect of the absolute perfection of the character of God. And there's never a promise that God has made that he won't fulfill. There is no covenant that God has established, entered into, that he's not going to make good on. In other words, we may be absolutely certain that God is utterly reliable. God is utterly reliable. Uh, it comes everywhere, doesn't it? Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7. You didn't turn to it. I'll just quote it to you very briefly. But I was reading it earlier on as it came to mind. Deuteronomy 7. Um, speaking of the way God is, uh, is, is keeping his oath that he swore to his fathers and has brought his people out with a mighty hand and so on. Then verse 9 of Deuteronomy 7. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So that's, uh, that is, uh, that's pretty good, isn't it? That's, a, that's a, a good long way. Now, what I want to do is set this aspect of God's faithfulness uh, where it sits here in Lamentations 3 in a place that is absolutely staggering. And the context, as I read it for you, is startling and it is actually unpredictable. And it is the very context in which we find this expression of God's faithfulness that makes it all the more remarkable. It was impossible for me to read this without everybody understanding that the circumstances there are dark and they are bleak. That what we have here in Lamentations 3, the very word itself, is in keeping with the whole notion of a lament. And here we have Jeremiah lamenting the state of the people of God, he as their representative. And he is reflecting on what had happened to the people of God, both as a nation and as individuals, when they had suffered under the destruction of Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. And what he's reflecting on here is the absolute staggering reality of what had taken place. And these words, incidentally, are still used by Jewish people at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. And if we were able to interpret their Hebrew to explain it to ourselves, then we would discover that part of what they're saying is what is being expressed here in Lamentations 3. If your Bible is open, you can look back to chapter 2, and you see there that the picture of Jerusalem is that her gates, verse 9 of chapter 2, her gates have sunk into the ground. He has ruined and broken her bars. Her king and princes are among the nations. The law is no more, and her prophets find no vision from the Lord. That's pretty tough. The gates are gone. The king is gone. The law is gone. And the prophets have got nothing really anything good to say concerning anything at all. And if that were not an, a graphic enough description of the reality, look down to verse 20. Look, O Lord, and see, with whom have you dealt thus? Should women eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care? In other words, the people have been reduced to cannibalism. Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? So just allow that to settle in your mind. There's no worship. There's no leader. There's no temple. There's really no nothing. And what makes it so staggering is that God is behind all of this. Verse 12 of chapter 1, Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see. Is there any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger? So that behind the actual activities of Nebuchadnezzar and his forces of oppression, you don't find the evil one 
you know, winning 3 nothing in the first half of this issue, as if somehow or another the evil one is stronger now than God himself. No, you look behind all of this devastation to the very hand and mind and purpose of God. That's what makes it so amazing that we don't pull the curtain back and find that this is the activities of the evil one, but we pull the curtain back and find that God is behind all this. That's why Cowper, when he wrestled with it in his own life, eventually says, I can't see the footsteps of God. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea. If he planted them in the sand, you could see them, but he plants them in the sea. You can't see footsteps in the sea. In other words, the way in which God chooses to act, the things that he does, are absolutely staggering. They are profoundly unpredictable. And they are, in this occasion, the experience of Jeremiah as virtually a representative of the whole nation. He, you notice, speaks in the first person, where he says, I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. In other words, he just personalizes what is a national experience. And he is obviously a foreshadowing of another prophet who would one day suffer, another prophet who would be able to exercise these words as his own personal lament, as he also endured the wormwood and the gall. All of this just speaks of a complete agony of heart. It is the lament of a very godly Israelite, a lament that is then usable by many subsequent godly individuals who are non-Israelites but find themselves in similar straits. And I'm not going to take you through this, but if you look, for example, let me give you an indication of it. If you look in verse 7, he has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. Uh, the, 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 the forces uh, of evil, uh, the, the Babylonians, were known for a special form of imprisonment where they blocked in their prisoners, making it impossible for them even to stretch out their arms. They were, complete, they were completely trapped inside and blocked in this way. And that's the picture that he picks up. Though I call and cry out for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stones. He has made my paths crooked. So it is, uh, the context is one of absolute agony. Then in verse 19, he talks to himself. He cries out, so from the context to the cry, if that's helpful to you, remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. So he is wrestling with the fact that his experience is so devastating, and yet he knows that God is loyal, that he's faithful, and that he's trustworthy. And so he knows that what he's going to have to do is to reflect purposefully on what he knows of God. He's going to, if you like, have to take the circumstances that confront him in his life, that confront the people of God in this way, and put them within the framework of the theology of a faithful God. And so in verse 21, you will notice that it is not in the realm of his emotion, but in the realm of his mind that he begins to make progress. This is, of course, a very important principle, isn't it? But this I call to mind. He doesn't say, this is my lot, but I've managed to convince myself that I ought to feel better about it. Or this is my lot, but uh, every day is a Friday, so I'm, I'm, I really don't need to worry about it. Or this is my lot, but I'm going to find my best life now, and, and, and all is going to be well. No. He says, this is the experience of the people of God, but this I call to mind. This is what I call to mind. And what is that? Verse 22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Or in the King James Version, it is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. In other words, the picture of the steadfast love of the Lord is seen in the fact, he says, that we're still around. This is exactly what we're going through. But God's mercy, God's steadfast love, God's faithfulness never comes to an end. 
And the word that is used there for steadfastness, the steadfast love of the Lord, is actually in the plural if it's of interest to you. In other words, the steadfast love of the Lord is so immense that it can't really be covered in the singular. And the word that is used of his love is actually a feminine word. It's the love of a mother, the love of a mother for her feeding child. Now, do you get this? Do you see what's happening here? Do you, do you understand how vitally important this is, that the faithfulness of God is not something that simply exists when the band is playing and the army is marching and the sun is shining and all is well with our souls. No, the faithfulness of God is of vital information to us when the reverse is the case, when we're up against it, when we find ourselves approximating to this. And what you have here in this little section is just like somebody turned a, turned a big light on in the very darkness, that a pool of light shines out into the darkness of the circumstances. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, he says. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. So, in other words, if I'm going to continue to brood in this way, if I'm going to continue to reflect on circumstances as they are, if I'm going to continue to allow this to be the source of my depression, then so be it. But in actual fact, what I'm going to do is change my focus. And I'm going to focus on the fact that even though these things are as they are, even though God is behind this, even though we cannot squirrel away out of the reality that the dark side of providence is still the providence of God, that he cannot only be in charge of the healing, he has to be in charge of the cancer as well. He cannot only be in charge of the good, he's also in charge of the bad. He's never the author of sin but he is sovereign over all these things. So Jeremiah is teaching us that it is when we face these dark things, when we face these deep difficulties, when we are confronted by circumstances that appear to simply wall us in and make it impossible for us to move, when our progress is impeded, when everything seems dark around us, when we think that we could never pray again and we can never give voice to another song of praise. It is in that context that he says, and this is what I bring to mind. This is what I bring to mind, and therefore I have hope. He's being transformed by the renewing of his mind. My flesh and my heart may fail. That's Psalm 73. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You see, that's what makes it significant, isn't it? My flesh and my heart may fail. They do fail. And so he says, you... You look upon me as I remember my affliction and my wanderings and all the bitterness, verse 19. That ought to make you think of another one who was confronted by bitterness and gall, the Lord Jesus himself. He could call out to the Father, remember my affliction, the wormwood and the gall. They offered him wine mingled with gall on the cross as we said this morning, but he wouldn't drink it. It's a reminder of the fact that the mercy of God, the faithfulness of God, the covenant love of God is seen in the fact that his Son comes to bear the curse which we deserve, the curse that it lies upon us. And he bears that curse in himself. And as a result of that, the believer has hope. Now, let me just finish this up, because I don't want to belabor it this evening. The point is well made. It's made even by a careful reading of the text. You don't need a lot of iteration. Verse 21, But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Verse 24, The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope. I have hope, and I will hope. In other words, he's saying, I'm going to depend on God's providential care. Providence, as we've often said to one another, is a soft pillow. Providence is a soft pillow. You've spent many a night, as I have spent a night, punching my pillow. 
longing for sleep, troubled by circumstances, overwhelmed by the prospect of a new day, saddened by my errors and my sinfulness and my waywardness, under the invigilating eye of the evil one who accuses us even though we are in Christ. And eventually, how do you go to sleep? Well, you can try and play games with yourself, or you can finally get theological. And it is in our theology that there is peace, that there is hope, that there is rest. And outside of it, there isn't any, save for superficial things. I have hope, and I will hope because his mercies are new every morning, and they never come to an end, and they're new in the morning when I wake up, I don't need to run ahead of him. Each day, Jesus said, has got enough trouble of his own, therefore I don't need to rush ahead and import tomorrow's troubles into today, and certainly not in tonight when I go to my bed. I don't need to run ahead of him. And secondly, if I'm trusting in his providence, I don't need to second-guess him. He knows best. I don't know. I don't know much. And when we consider something like this, and we say, I don't know how this could possibly be, and I don't like what I see here, and I certainly don't like if ever I approximate to it, the but comes, but I will trust him, but I will walk with him, but I will learn to say through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. And through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. I wonder, do you agree with me that whoever it was that sang the song, I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony, and then I think Coca-Cola stole that for themselves, if I remember correctly, I'd like to buy the world a Coke or something it was. Um, it was not a bad little song, but not of any lasting value. What about this idea that the Christian says, uh, I, I'd like to teach the world to cry. I'd like to teach the world how to cry. He said, no, that couldn't possibly be, because the Christian is the joyful one. The Christian is the one who's got to teach the world how to sing, how to laugh, how to rejoice, how to do all the other things. Yeah, but there's, the, only the Christian can teach the world how to cry, what to cry about, and how to cry. And the absence of lament in contemporary evangelical Christianity is arguably one of the things that presents to the watching world a substantial sense of a Christianity that is not actually authentic, that it is apparently all on the upside, all on the sunny side, all on the triumph side. And so the people say, well, I don't know how they got there and I don't know how you stay there, and I don't understand how all of that works. And sure, there is the upside and the triumph side, and Christ has triumphed over the grave. But the fact is that if you you had no other legitimate way for, for, for crying the blues and screaming out in the darkness of the night, if you had no other place to which you could go in the Bible, then go to Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood and his soul was stirred within him, even to the point of saying, I can't cope with this. Even to the point of saying, Father, if there's any other possible way of doing this redemption thing, now would be a good time to come up with it. That was Christ. So we don't do any service to anybody by suggesting that we just skate thinly over the circumstances of life, that we are now triumphant over these issues, that we are the ones who've got it all taped. One, it isn't true to the Bible, and two, it isn't true to our lives. 
That's not to say that we're going out with like uh, old gloomy two-shoes to let everybody know how wretched and miserable we are. That's a different story altogether. But no, the, the champion of our salvation is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And people hid, as it were, their faces from him. And he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Jeremiah surveys the total mayhem of the people of God decimated, the law gone, the king gone, the prophet silenced. The thing is a complete, total shambles. And he says, But this I call to mind. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Father, thank you that you are a faithful God. Thank you that you have established your faithfulness in dealing with your people throughout all the ages, that you have committed to your people in covenant love, that you are an initiative-taking God, that even when through fiery trials our pathway shall lie, your grace all-sufficient has been our supply, for you will be with us in trials to bless and sanctify to us our deepest distress. Lord, you know our lives tonight. You know where we are. Sunday by Sunday, we gather as a congregation marked in part by quiet desperation, that behind our hellos and goodbyes and how are yous, there are lives that are in the throes of disappointment and defeat, sadness, fear, a sense of being walled in and trapped. Some of us wrestling with the issues of our sexuality, wondering what to say, how to say, how to deal, how to live, how to find you. Will you use these dying moments of our time together now? Will you use these emblems that Jesus has left to us of bread broken and wine poured out to remind us of the wonder of who Jesus is? We pray humbly in his name. Amen.